Today, I'm going to be comparing the three-year-old Canon 5D Mark IV against the one-year-old Canon EOS R. So why am I doing this? There's several reasons. Canon is releasing a 5D Mark V next year, and a mirrorless version of the 5D, much like Canon released the 90D and the M6 Mark II. The price of the 5D Mark IV can be had for $2,500. Used gear can be had for between $500 and $1,000 off that price. The EOS R is about $900 less on current sales, and the 5D Mark IV is at the upper limit of affordability for the average filmmaker. I even considered getting the 5D Mark IV myself this summer, but I decided not to. Stick around to the end of this video, and I'll tell you why. The rest of this video, I'm going to look at the outcomes, the capabilities I expect to get from a hybrid camera that focuses, in my particular view viewpoint, mostly on video. I'll present the differences for both cameras from the perspective of an ordinary filmmaker. As an ordinary filmmaker, video capabilities are very important to me, more so than photo capabilities. So that you guys don't have to take a lot of notes during this video, I'm going to summarize the capabilities in the top quarter of the screen. Then periodically, I'll blow these up full screen so that you can take a screenshot. The video capability that matters the most to me is continuous, reliable, and trustworthy autofocus. I don't want to have to check each video clip to see if I'm in focus. When you're shooting family members going about their daily lives, they're not acting. You want to get it right the first time. If you try to get them to a second time, it's just not going to work out. Now both of these cameras, the 5D Mark IV and the EOS R, do a terrific job of autofocusing. With the release of firmware 1.4 for the EOS R, I autofocus is now accurate up to about 10 feet, which is terrific for YouTubers and videographers like myself. But the EOS R has one other feature that we've been wishing for for a long time, and that's focus peaking. You'll watch a lot of YouTube videos that talk about you shouldn't use autofocus, you should be using manual focus. But what these people don't tell you is that they have access to advanced features such as focus peaking, where by looking through the viewfinder or an LCD, they can visually see what is in focus so it's, easily, it's easy to manually pull the focus. Previously to us in the 70D, the 5D Mark IV, and other Canon cameras, we couldn't do this unless we got into the cinema line. So this is a huge plus for the ordinary filmmaker. So let's do a quick summary of the autofocus capabilities of these two cameras. The 5D has 61 autofocus points and they're clustered around the middle. This makes it difficult for people who are trying to focus on people that are positioned into the kind of one third sections of the frame. The EOS R on the other hand has 555 phase detect autofocus points that are pretty much edge to edge. It has eye autofocus and it has accurate autofocus up to minus 6 EV. The EOS R also has the ability to focus in low light up to minus 6 EV. Now when I say low light, I'm not talking about indoors, I'm talking about at night in the city or in the country with just the moon lighting the scene. That's a big deal. So while both cameras have Canon's dual pixel autofocus, the EOS R is that much better. It's had three years to improve, to be able to shoot in low light to minus 6 EV and still be able to hold focus. That's amazing. And of course, the autofocus points edge to edge. The number of times I haven't been able to grab focus because my subject went to the edge of the screen and was kind of running at a diagonal and they went out of focus. And the EOS R doesn't have any mechanical parts for the autofocus system. Therefore, there's nothing to go out of alignment. Simply put, Canon's dual pixel autofocus for the EOS R is the best, most reliable, trustworthy autofocus system in the hybrid camera market today, and will be until the 1DX Mark III comes out sometime in spring. Sorry, I just saw a squirrel. Squirrel! Oh no, 
Now I'm beginning to sound like Casey from cam Camera Conspiracies. That boy is always looking at squirrels. Sorry, it won't happen again. Both cameras provide 4K, but the 5D provides DCI 4K. DCI 4K is 256 pixels wider than UHD 4K. But why do we care as ordinary, ordinary filmmakers? Well, we don't. Either will work fine for us, but the final product should be outputted in UHD 4K. That's 3840 by 2160. YouTube can handle UHD. Our computer monitors are set to UHD. So if you're sharing on YouTube or sharing with friends and family, then UHD is what you want to be able to use. Now, both cameras do a pretty good job of 4K, and they can capture it in a lot of detail. The 5D Mark IV uses motion JPEG. Yeah, I, I can't say that with a straight face. Um, it's like driving a bus around town. The files are huge, and they don't need to be. But the detail is good. And that's a great thing about the 4K on the 5D. You get a lot of good detail. And let, we're not going to confuse that with dynamic range, but the detail on the 5D Mark IV is very good. These are is soft. So I think that the 5D Mark IV here produces better results. Now, in terms of file sizes, the EOS R can also produce large files. If you're recording 4K in all I, you're going to be pushing upwards of 500 megabits a second. Now, let's take a look at 1080p. All my projects are outputted in 1080p. 1080p is important to me. I don't want to have to shoot 4K and downsample to 1080p if I can get a really sharp image. And 1080p is good on both cameras, but not as good as downsampling. And how downsampling works is you record in 4K, you set up your project as 1080p. Then when you import your video into that project, your software will automatically downsample it. And here's what essentially happens. You take a full frame of 4K information, which has four times the amount of information as 1080p. And that's what gives you that extra detail. But if you do shoot in 4K, be prepared for the file sizes. They're going to be huge. As I just mentioned, they're four times as large. So I recommend using at least, well, I wouldn't say at least, but you, you should be using 256 gig cards or you'll just go through those 128s pretty quick. Well, what do you do once you film them? You take them and bring them into your computer. So you're probably going to need external drives or you're going to beef up a lot inside your computer. You're going to need terabytes of data. I currently use about 400 gigabytes of information for a one hour film. 4K would be four times that amount. And of course, with your rendering and everything else you're doing, you're probably going to need several terabytes for an hour of film doing 4K. But the results can be worth it. So both cameras can provide you with that high detail. The EOS R, because it's soft, doesn't allow you to punch in, and that's kind of important. The benefits of 4K, you're able to preserve a lot of detail in 1080p. You can simulate multiple camera angles, and you can zoom in for close-ups without loss of detail. You can even pan without suffering from rolling shutter. But this only works if you have sharp 4K. With soft 4K, once you zoom in, you're going to notice that your 1080p isn't as good. On the EOS R, I lose a lot of these advantages, but on the 5D Mark IV, I'm able to preserve that detail, and which is really, really good. You don't need CF Express cards. You don't need CF cards to record video. The reason why these high-end cameras like the 1DX have CF Express cards is because they're shooting so many photos, and they're designed for sports photographers to get 16, 20 frames a second in RAW. And when you're shooting that many frames a second, you need a very, very, very fast card, as fast as you can get. But for video, you can shoot 4K 60 on a standard UHS card. And a UHS 2 will allow you to go faster and to capture things such as 4K 120. Nope, there's no rumors that Canon's gonna bring 4K 120 to us anytime soon, but the very, there is a very strong rumor that the Sony A7S 3 it's like spotting the Loch Ness Monster, but I think we can expect to see that in 2020, and it will have, according to rumors, 
4K 120. I think it would be unfair to talk about high detail without talking about Apple ProRes or Avid's equivalent of ProRes, DNX HD. Now, for most of us ordinary filmmakers when we're starting out, you probably don't have to worry about this, and I'll tell you where you do have to worry about it. If your computer really struggles with the video from the camera, it spends a lot of time rendering, then consider converting to Apple ProRes. Apple ProRes works on Windows as well as Mac software. And what it is, is it's a codec that's designed for editing that preserves a lot of detail, gives you 10 bits of color information. So when you're working with colors, even though you might be shooting in 8-bit, once you start editing, it gives you the extra range so you're not clipping and ruining your, your, um, your colors. It's also a very fast and efficient codec. You might be having trouble with your camera because it's a slightly different format than what your video editing software is used to. Once you convert it to Apple ProRes 422, that is greatly improved. If you're gonna be shooting with a Canon 90D, Canon 5D, Canon EOS R, or even the 1DX when it comes out, the 1DX Mark III, you're gonna to wanna to shoot with ProRes 422. Proxy, the, if you don't care about the quality and the detail, sure, go ahead and use Proxy. But if you do wanna preserve that quality and the detail, ProRes 422 is the way to go. If you're currently shooting in all I, ProRes 422 is only about 10 to 15% bigger. I converted over to ProRes this year because I was starting to notice slowdowns once I got past about 40 minutes in my project. So I'd start it up and Final Cut would just be really slow for about five or 10 minutes until I let it finish doing its rendering and whatever it does on startup. Once I started using ProRes, it was super quick. And I didn't convert the entire project. I just started using ProRes for the rest of the project. So again, if you're starting out new, don't worry about it. But as you're ready to start tweaking and getting the benefits of your camera without having to buy a new one, ProRes is one of those things that can help you preserve your detail when you're doing editing. The 5D Mark IV and the EOS R were both criticized for their lack of 120 frames per second. The 5D Mark IV was released, released in 2016, and it had a maximum frame rate of 60 frames per second in 1080p. Sure, you got 120 frames per second in 720. Despite what other filmmakers tell you, it isn't good enough. I want that detail. Even in 2016, the competition had 120 frames per second. So here we are at the end of 2019, and the EOS R, which is one year old, looks really old with that same limitation. 60 frames per second in 1080 and 120 in 720. There's no exception when the competition has 4K 60, has 120 frames per second in 1080p. Color accuracy. Other people refer to it as color science. I'm looking for accurate colors. And that's what I like about Canons. What they shoot doesn't require a lot of editing. You get those great skin tones. I want to reproduce the world the way it is. I want to capture life the way it is. Now, if I do want to start fiddling around with giving a sort of matrix look and feel, I can use color wheels, color tools, and I can use LUTs. But as an ordinary filmmaker, the first thing I want to do is just get the colors the way they are, balance them so they look accurate to the real world before I worry about grading. I'm gonna talk about the basic frame rates, 24, 25, and 30 frames per second. This is how we capture television shows. This is how we capture basic video. I'm not talking about slow motion where we get into uh, using 60 frames, 120 frames per second, or special rates that theatrical movies use, such as 48 frames per second. I already created a video on this that talks in more detail about what frame rate you should use. I'm currently using 30 frames per second because I don't want that motion blur. I like to capture things as accurately as they are. Both of these cameras provide the standard 24 and 30 frames per second. These are standard frame rates for North America. Most of the rest of the world is using PAL and that's where 25 frames per second comes in as your basic look. Clean HDMI. I touched on this earlier. Both cameras allow you to output the video signal right from the sensor, sensor through HDMI without all that 
focus peaking information or other detailed information that you see when you look through the viewfinder. The Canon 5D Mark IV, you're limited to 1080p. The Canon EOS R will allow you to output in 4K, but you also get 10-bit 422, which is an improvement over the 8-bit that you get in camera. Canon doesn't have in-body image stabilization. There's rumors that they're going to bring it out in 2020 and apply it to all cameras. I'm skeptical. While I believe that Canon will release in-body image stabilization, I don't believe it's going to be for all cameras, and I don't think it's going to be what we imagine it to be. In-body image stabilization works very, very well on small sensors like the Micro Four Thirds, but when you get up to a full frame, that sensor's that much bigger and heavier that it's hard to really create that smooth stabilization that you would get with a glide cam or a gimbal or the use of a tripod. I wouldn't get too worried and caught up with a lack of in-body image stabilization. Purchase lenses with image stabilization, use other tools and techniques from framing, using tripods, and I've got videos on that, how to create that smooth motion. Canon does have a lot of lenses. There's over 107, no, there's, there's exactly 107 EF and EFS lenses. There's six RF and eight more RF lenses to be coming out in 2020. If you buy the EOS R, you're not limited to that small pool of lenses. With an adapter, anywhere from free to $200, depending on the package you purchase, you can snap on an EF and an EFS lens. One word of caution though, if you put an EFS lens on your EOS R, you're gonna get that 1.6 times crop. It's not necessarily bad, but it's gonna change your look and feel, so keep that in mind. C-Log is an important capability, especially for the Canon 5D Mark IV. Without it, images appear soft, flat, but for that extra $100, and yes, you do have to ship that camera back to Canon, which can take a day to seven days, they'll upgrade the camera for you, give you C-Log, and the end results will provide you a greater level of detail and dynamic range. But keep in mind, you are gonna to have to do more work in post-production. You're gonna to have to learn about LUTs and color grading. It's not a lot of work, but it is essential if you're gonna be getting the 5D Mark IV and using it primarily for video, which raises the price to $2,600 based on today's prices. And the EOS R already comes with C-Log built in. And the C-Log provides slightly better dynamic range, so you're gonna get better results out of the EOS R than you will be with the 5D Mark IV. The 5D Mark IV has dual SD cards. The EOS R only has one. However, if you're gonna be recording video, you really only get to write to one card at a time, so you're losing the benefits. Remember, the 5D Mark IV is primarily aimed at photographers. For video, not so much. I, I think the EOS R is definitely better at video, and this is one of those reasons. I really do like having that advantage of dual card slots, but Neither camera is going to offer that capability here for video. Flip screens. I love them. They're essential. Uh, if you're going to be moving around a lot, you're going to go down and get low shots or high shots, you want that flip screen. It's essential. Otherwise, you're going to be crouching down or trying to get up high so you can be at eye level with the view screen. A definite plus for the EOS R versus the 5D Mark IV in this capability. The big advantage to the 5D Mark IV and the EOS R is you're dealing with a full frame sensor you no longer have to deal with that crop factor. Unless, of course, you're shooting in 4K. On the Canon 90D, if I'm shooting in 1080p, I have a 1.6 crop factor because of the cropped APS-C sensor. On the 5D and the EOS R, when I'm shooting 1080p, I'm shooting full sensor wide. I'm not cropping it at all. But when I go to 4K, I'm getting about a 1.74 crop. It's a little bit higher on the 5D because of the DCI 4K. And this is where that matters. If you're gonna be mixing 1080p and 4K video from the, for the same scene, some of your shots are gonna be zoomed in much further than the other. So if you're shooting in 1080p, you'll have a much wider scene. You go to 4K, it's gonna automatically crop in. And the only way to work around that is to take off the lens, put on another lens to make up for that focal difference, or you move the tripod around. And this is a little frustrating. If you're always shooting in 4K and downsampling to 1080p, or you're always shooting in 1080, this is not such a big deal. But I disagree with a lot of people who say that the crop factor is a terrible thing. It isn't. 
It depends on what your outcomes are, what capabilities you're looking for. If you're a wildlife photographer, that crop allows you to zoom in. So a 1.74 allows you to zoom in by about 70%. Again, know your outcomes. Know that there's a crop factor. Know what type of results that gives you, but it doesn't necessarily make it a bad thing. Canon does provide a drop-in filter mount adapter with a variable ND filter. It sits between the camera and the lens, so you don't need to buy a filter for every lens. It's $400 and only has one major annoyance. The manual adjustment wheel is very sensitive that it can be easily bumped into a different setting. So you really have to keep an eye on that. But if you're starting out for the ordinary filmmaker, don't worry about ND filters. They're not important. You can do decent jobs without them. Wait till you've got a few years experience before you start wanting to get into ND filters. Both cameras do time-lapse and both cameras have rolling shutter. I kind of sold that as though it's a benefit. It's not. The rolling shutter is what happens when you move your camera from side to side really quickly. The video essentially warps. The one way to eliminate this is, is to shoot in 4K and then pan within that 4K space for a 1080p project. The 5D Mark IV is designed primarily for photographers. It has dual card slots. It can shoot with autofocus continuously at 7 frames a second compared to the EOS R, which you might be lucky to get 3 frames a second. The EOS R also suffers from color banding. Tony Northrup did a video to show what happens when you try to recover highlights more than three stops. The banding is noticeable and it's terrible. If I was primarily a photographer, I would definitely look at the 5D Mark IV. It's a very sturdy camera. It shoots very fast. All things that the EOS R doesn't do as well. And maybe that's why we see about $1,000 difference in price even today. Now what's surprising here is that the processor in the EOS R is faster. It's the Digic 8 versus the Digic 6. It does provide better imaging. At the beginning of this film, I told you that I was going to tell you why I didn't go with the 5D Mark IV. So video, dynamic range isn't very good. I can't shoot 120 frames per second in 1080p. 4K, it's pretty good, but I'm limited in my frame rates. The EOS R, it's got a lot going for it, but it's copied the same lack of slow motion in 1080p. It's just not enough. It's got soft 4K. The autofocus is brilliant. I autofocus, I love it. I'm still shooting on my 70D and I'm happy with the results that I'm getting. I'm willing to wait another six months because I really do believe 2020 is gonna be an amazing year. I'm really interested to see what the 5D or 5D equivalent will be in the mirrorless space to see what the high megapixel camera will be like for video. Generally, if you've got a high megapixel camera, the focus is not going to be on video. Look at the 5DR and the 5DS. Or will Canon provide an update to the EOS R and give us a Mark II? I don't need a camera right now. If you do need a camera right now, the Canon 90D is better for the ordinary average filmmaker. I really want to thank you guys for watching this video, for clicking like and subscribe, for supporting me. If you haven't subscribed, please go ahead and click like and subscribe. It really keeps this channel going and encourages me to create new content. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon.